Hey, what's up? Hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm fucking exhausted, to be honest with you. Oh, can I swear on Twitch? Because we can't swear on YouTube anymore. You can swear, just no racial slurs or any of that crazy brochialist stuff. I know you guys are so <laughs> fond of, but um, no, as long as you don't have any like... Um, <laughs> That's, by the way, if you branded my show somehow as using a bunch of racial no, slurs... No, 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 I'm just messing with you. Don't worry, don't worry. It's the most brilliant out-of-the-gate move you could do. I, wouldn't, I would never do that to you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but as long, like, as long as there's like no racial slurs or anything like that, like we're fine. I wouldn't expect you to, but yeah, that's generally well, online. I, I don't understand any of those. Are we live now? Um, yeah, I'm live on my channel now. Hi, everybody. All right. Um, so I'm a big fan of yours. We've almost talked in the past, um, but then I think we just kind of missed connecting yeah. in a while. Um, I'm generally a pretty big fan of what goes on with your show um, and everything you and Sam Cedar talk about. Uh, I think my favorite conversation I've heard of you is you on... Uh, Sargon of Akkad, the regressive left. Uh, that conversation <laughs> nice. was a lot of fun. And yeah, so you're here today probably because a lot of mutuals are poking the fuck out of you guys because a lot of people get mad at my Twitter stuff. And somehow we ended up on discussing the TPP, which I imagine will broaden out to our general ideas about like neoliberalism or protectionist trade policy or something around those lines, I guess. Yeah, I mean, sort of. I also just want to, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, you, I'm assuming, do you have like familiarity with my work on both shows? Because um, maybe, maybe TMBS might, might be a little bit more where there's like some sort of more clear divergences, possibly just in terms of topic selection. I, I'm familiar with you because I get linked a bunch of stuff, but I mean, I'm sure, you know, it's impossible to listen right. to like, to keep up with anybody yeah, else. Show. No, so much time. Sense. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, get, I, I mean, my totally general sense. idea of you is that you would be yes. like, um, like a, I think a democratic socialist, at least like somebody left leaning more than like a sock dem, Um, and that all of your views kind of line up where I would expect to for that, like anti-imperialist pro, pro worker, um, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, and may and I maybe uh, you know if this is productive, so, uh, maybe we'll have more conversation slash debates or whatever. Because I uh, let me just say how I kind of perceive like why we're here too. Uh -huh. And one is that my impression of you uh, has definitely you know definitely been positive, and uh, we've had and it's been funny because it's been mutuals who several months ago were like, oh yeah, like you guys are both great and. You know, you'll have some disagreements, but you guys should team up to destroy X, Y, or Z person. Yeah. And in the last couple of weeks, it's been like, no, nah, you got to, like, you know, hold this guy in check or whatever. And I guess what I'm honestly trying to figure out is – so I feel like there's three things going on with, like, with, with, with what you're putting out. I'm trying to think of, cause I, I'm just, uh -huh. just a value neutral way of saying it. So like one is, I think that you are reacting to certain annoying social media habits that you might associate with a certain ideological tendency. Right. Uh -huh. And so for me, First of all, I think that that is true of every single ideological tendency. Oh, yeah. I think it's a problem of social media. It's a problem of kind of brand creation. And maybe we could have some ideas together, uh, some strategies for generally making that whole environment better. But I'm just not terribly interested, you know, in those kind of arguments, I guess partially because, I mean, to be honest, partially one is because some one of the things I do, and I don't really cover much stuff like that, mm -hmm. but to some extent on TMBS, like there is a little bit of like, a, you know, hey guys, let's actually, you know, let's be more strategic and more thoughtful about how we promote, uh, you know, the politics we want, essentially. Let's be a little bit more thoughtful about reaching a broader audience, right? So even like what you said before, pro worker and anti imperialist 100% and then there's like uh you know there's like a certain type of like, like trivial discourse version of that which I wouldn't want to be associated with just like I'm sure you wouldn't want to be associated with like some totally brain dead you know like oh like some economist said it so it has to be true or you know some type of like IDW like adjacent just sort of like you know a historical nerdery so, you know, I feel like so, but part of what I feel like is going on is that you are maybe you're reacting to some things that can be frustrating, can even be misleading at times, but maybe you're 
falling into, and this is a danger that we all get into. I know, no doubt, I do this on Twitter. But like, you know, someone like Nate Silver, like Nate Silver is doing that same thing for a different team, right? Like he's he's very shaky on his poll methodology right now. He's extremely ideologically motivated. And he's got an axe to grind against certain, uh, you know, one particular candidate. It happens to be Bernie Sanders. But I mean, I, I just, I'll end in a second, but I just want to say as an example, I'm someone who said out of the gate, if you ask me ideologically and programmatically, what do I think of Joe Biden? Uh-huh. I am, you know, his absolute ideological opposite. Uh-huh. But I also think that a lot of people are underestimating the resiliency of his appeal. So we shouldn't uh, confuse objective and subjective is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think I agree. And I guess, and that, yeah. OK, yeah. So and then Can I think I, like the next before yeah, going through go all ahead. three, just yeah. to respond really quickly. Yeah, yeah go. Um, go, go, go. So, yeah, um, definitely. I react to positions that people take on social media. I think it's somewhat understandable considering that's kind of my life exists in this space. Um, I do agree that you have to be careful that reacting to social media or reacting to toxic fan bases is one thing, but you can't let your reactions define your ideology. And that it, even though it doesn't right. come off that way sometime, like that is, I, I'm very mindful of that. Um, I, like, it's not like, um, like I'm sure you've heard the person like, you know, I used to be in favor of Democrats or something, but then I heard this one guy was an SJW and now I'm literally anti-immigration, anti-black people. It's like, what? Yeah, I would never let um, I, I don't let I, people I felt some annoying person trying to like, you know, cancel Dave Chappelle. Mm-hmm. And now I support kidnapping children. Yeah. Or letting them die at the border. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I try not right. to define my my personal beliefs. Like I'm pro universal health care. Um, I'm pro immigration. I'm pro, you know, LGBT rights. Um, yeah. So, mm-hmm. I, yeah. So sometimes I think people get that impression of me that I'll get really annoyed with certain progressives on Twitter because those tend to be the loudest right now, especially the Chapo Trap House flavor of like like lefty kind of people. Um, but that, yeah, but it gets a little annoying when I react to people like this and then I get the, oh, well, now you're a conservative. And it's like, I don't think that's how that works, but okay. Well, I don't think, yeah, and I don't read you as a conservative, but as I say, I, you mm-hmm. know, I, I did mention Nate Silver because I do think you are potentially like, and I, and I just want to, you know, I have to just do the disclaimer that when you say Chapo, like obviously, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm friendly with some of the guys on the show. It's a very diverse fan base and their content which I don't keep up with all of it because mm-hmm. we can't keep up with all content. So that's just the truth. But they're smart guys and everything else. Yeah, but it's like, to be very clear, I'm only referring to the subreddit, not the actual, not the podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm and, sorry. And I got to be honest, there's going to be uh, some of these areas like, like yeah. and this is one of the reasons why I said like, you know, kind of to avoid social media drama because it's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. For sure. I'm not on subreddits. Yeah, I'm I not. That's not what it's deaf. I mean, in fact, if one of the like, subliminal messages of my show in particular is like, you know, let's translate this into real shit. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons I really do admire Bernie Sanders on the campaign so much, right? I yeah. think regardless of where you fall on the policy set, that is a serious presidential campaign of really committed people who have serious visions across the board, right? Yeah, kitchen table um, issues, right? Yeah. Kitchen table, but also global and even also, you know, on civil rights, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, but it's a policy set yeah. and it's a, you know, it's a serious effort. So the next two things that I think are like, okay, and then maybe, you know, and this could lead into trade mm-hmm. is one is like, are you saying at times like, well, actually, let me, let me stick with the uh, flowing out of this sort of like reaction of economy. Are you saying like when when you appeal when you tell people like the you know such and such policy isn't as popular as you may think as an example are you suggesting that like I guess there's this is where it gets really complicated and I just want to be clear with you and I'm sorry that I'm I'm fumbling here yeah, but are you saying that a I like Do you actually support, let's just get to TPP. Do you support TPP as it is currently constituted and written with no modifications, no changes, no understanding of the subtleties of the problems, which we can get into? Mm -hmm. Or are you saying, hey, people who are laymen should just outsource their opinions to so-called experts. So like if certain economists say it's a good deal, we should do it. Or three, are you saying, you guys don't understand how popular this is with the general public because those are three really different positions. So I just want to be 
kind of clear generally of what I'm sort of, you know, where you're coming from. Um, yeah, hold on, let me write these down so I'm not losing track of these. Um, okay, okay yeah. so just kind of like disentangling a couple of these and then looking at some of these. So when I, so sometimes I talk about things where I say, this policy isn't as popular as you may think, and people hear me say that, and they might think like, oh, well, you hate universal healthcare or something. Um, so something that I push back on right. a lot, um, and this is kind of like a frustration that I had in, in 2016. My, my biggest frustration with the, with the Bernie math or whatever, like that type of thinking, wasn't that like, I hate Bernie and I hate Bernie bros, and you know, Hillary's the queen is gonna take over. It was more just like, hey, I don't think we have a realistic assessment of where the electorate is right now. And man, it's going to be real shocking when, you know, our candidate gets steamrolled because nobody knows what's going on. And sometimes I see people get a little bit too lost in their own circle jerks where they say things like, oh, Medicare for all with all private insurance removed. That's like 88 percent popular with the American people. And it's like, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. I think that removing private insurance when you're going to cover like vision and dental, you're going to get a lot of pushback on that. And that's something to consider. Um, not saying that I don't approve of that. Obviously, single pair or multi pair would be infinitely better than what we have now, but I think it's good to be kind of aware of where the, the general opinions are for these types of issues. Sorry, so do you think, so, okay, so that, but that's interesting, right? Because, mm -hmm. and I don't want to retread ground you did with Mike yesterday. Sure. And it's honest, I watched some of it and I mean, Mike and I's read of the electorate based off of the empirical data mm -hmm. and what I've been saying for years, like this is something you could definitely see any number of videos where as an example, I'll say, okay, guys, like, there's sort of three facets of the electorate. And one is that so-called moderate voters are the absolute opposite of what your average pundit will call them on CNN, right? That's empirically true. So-called moderate voters, I'm sure, are probably somewhere to the right of you and me mm -hmm. on so-called social issues. And they are very much in the ballpark on economic issues, yeah. um, whether we're talking about trade or wage increases. And then there's a middle circle in politics, which makes these debates really hard, but it's in, inescapable, which does have to do with like, yes, how you ask a question in a poll does matter. If you poll people and you say, government is gonna take care of it, your tax increases will be lower than your premiums and every single thing is covered with no bullshit mm -hmm. and all of the most successful programs in the world do this, yes, it does have off the charts approval ratings. If you go to them and you say, it's gonna take away your healthcare plan and you know, we don't know what replaces it next, yes, that's gonna freak people out and change the results. So I feel like the debate, like pointing out how a poll number is, it, how a poll question is phrased is really only useful if you are either debunking a pure partisan talking point or you're trying to devise a campaign strategy. Like I think for conversations like this, if you and I both generally agreed that like say all things being equal, there's a consistent trend that shows most Democrats support single payer, there's a plurality of independents and a surprising amount of Republicans. And the reason that you might wanna not just have it be pure single payer has actually more to do with actual policy issues mm -hmm. and the efficacy of the implementation, which I'm happy to get to some other time, but that's a different yeah, question sure. than, the, than the polling. Yeah, I agree. So could we kind of be on, on the same page? Yeah, I on definitely that? agree with that. I just think it's I think it's good to have an understanding of where people are so that you don't get too lost. Um, so like for instance, because because anytime I have a conversation on a stream, if I say something that's wrong, I'm gonna get twenty people emailing me like why? And one of the impressions that I'd had, um, and just because I, I don't research every single point I'm talking about, sometimes I take things for granted. I've heard this a lot. I kind of assume, for instance, like, oh, a lot of Americans hate their healthcare. I mean, our healthcare outcomes are worse than other countries. I know that. Um, we spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world. I know that. So it makes sense to me that Americans hate their health care. But then I get linked to a whole bunch of like KFF health polling and stuff. And it's like, oh, shit, 80 percent of Americans are hybrid or private insurance. I had no idea about any of this. And now it's like, oh, fuck, like maybe I need to reconsider like how the average person views an issue because it's part of my job as like a like a public you know, speaker is to understand how people engage with these issues rather than just kind of preaching to an audience that already agrees with everything I say. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good instinct. And I think in general, you know, again, I think it's a mm -hmm. Part of the problem of the economy of social media is that reaction cycle. Now, the dialectic of it is, on the other hand, people put out a huge amount of lies and bullshit, yeah. and it's good to call them on it. So, you know, 
But I guess generally what I'm so even like if you framed it, you know, and I'm not telling you what to say, obviously, but I do mm -hmm. think honestly, like if I'm understanding you correctly out of this conversation, this would get a radically different reaction from probably like 90 percent of the people you're dealing with. And then maybe the people that would still go at you are just like, you know, whatever, fuck them. Right. Sure. If yeah. you said like, you know what, I think that. Yes, if you pay, if you pull this in any way fairly, Medicare for all is actually the most popular option that we have that is pullable. Mm -hmm. However, if you, you know, inject other variables into it, it could scare people because as an example, and this is actually to me is another great reason for having Medicare for all. Like, yes, Americans are fucking petrified about anything happening to their healthcare. I mean, that's yeah. one of the reasons that John Delaney really did disgust people so much, right? Is because he was distorting the policy efficacy and really misleading people on the technocratic aspect, on the technical aspects of it. But he's cueing people's terror about their healthcare, which is totally justified. And I can tell you as somebody who like, I've had years without healthcare, I've seen people struggle with various forms of this and that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you said like, this is the right policy uh, insofar as I could see. It does pull well, and but let's also be really thoughtful on the horizon about how it's gonna be propagandized and campaigned against and not be complacent. Yeah. That's just an absolutely correct and true statement. And anybody that would object to that mm -hmm. would be being ridiculous. I think the objection is when it's like, oh, now it's, you know what it is? It's almost, again, that's why I use the Nate Silver example. It's like, oh, wait a second, Destiny's a smart guy. Now he's carrying water for the opposite propaganda base. Because, you know, to be honest with you, it's not as prevalent today on social media, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole infrastructure of John Delaney's who are giving you the same hysterical half-truths, except they're, in fact, promoting a policy that is on net going to leave millions of people without health care or underinsured. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I disagree with any of that, yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to so, jump in? Yeah. So then, <laughs> to the TPP. Yeah. Um, you asked me a couple well, other questions. No, really that's, that's, no this, this is. I think this is actually. I mean, if you're cool with it, I think this is useful, and we can definitely like. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've got till a little after six. We'll get to TPP, but I think sure. this might be this. I think that this could. Be, I mean, because honestly, like, I'm not. You know, look, like, we can debate and argue, and it's fun, and it's great, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you. You know, there's been some stuff that, you know, you've said about Ben Burgess I've disagreed with. There's been some tweets I don't like, whatever. But I don't like I'm not on fucking Israeli TV debating some like Trump troglodyte. Like, sure. I don't think it's you know what I mean? Like, it's depending on who you ask. But but I yeah, I understand. <laughs> I don't think so. So I think it's better to, like, you know, clarify and make things more effective. And I think even on the healthcare one, mm -hmm. that seems like maybe we've moved the ball a little bit. Yeah, what you just guess, said is like is, yeah. is exactly the point that I've been echoing, that um, people like Delaney, regardless of whether you think the attacks are baseless or are fear-mongering, um, I mean, you know, another fear-monger were death panels. And that was a huge complaint that was levied against the, you know, the ACA, the Obamacare stuff. Like, if you can't handle that in a primary, like, what are you going to do in the general? Like, these are absolutely well, going to be... no doubt mm -hmm. about that. But yeah. I think the answer to that would be though is that that is absolutely a lie sure so when you go out and tweet about it and talk about it you have to say look mm -hmm. john delaney is being fundamentally dishonest here but don't be complacent because these could be potent talking points and by the way and that's see this is my 50 50 split this is where i am like third way or whatever because mm -hmm. if you like I am totally Chapo subreddit when it comes to call John Delaney a liar and be uh -huh. really goddamn clear about that because he is absolutely being fundamentally dishonest. I think, frankly, because I mean, look, let's be honest, the guy's worth over 60 million dollars because of his own money he's made in the insurance industry. Right. Like uh -huh. that has to be something to consider. Now, on conversely, if somebody just says, no, 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 all Bernie has to say is just like Medicare for all and it's wonderful. Then they're, I mean, they're being idiots even in a Marxist sense because we know that, I mean, cumulatively, the industry might spend like literally hundreds of billions of dollars to do what John Delaney did through every method of communication possible. Yeah, to reinforce so think, the status quo. Yeah. Yes. So I think what, you, what, 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 what would be awesome, you know, if that's your position and you were playing that dual role of like, hey, guys, like, let's get real here. And at the same time, of course, John Delaney's lying. And of course, I'm going to debunk propaganda. I think that would be 
super awesome and effective. And if somebody complained to you about that, I would be the first to have your back. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, um, with regards to TPP, though, I just want to hybrid it with one other thing. Sure. You're not actually saying that, like, okay, there's a small amount of things in the world, right? Like, I would uh-huh. say, like, okay, if if somebody's running a nuclear reactor or something, like, literally in the plant, although, actually, this is a bad example because I just watched Chernobyl. Sure, sure. But, like, I'm not going to go, like, I'm not going to go uh, in the coach's box for, you know, Venus Williams or Rafael Nadal and be like, I, I got this, right? Uh-huh. Like. There is there are certain uh, functions that are highly technically proficient. There's a very specific role that they play, and it almost is more like it isn't obviously, but it's closer to just like two plus two equals four. When we're talking about policy and we're talking about something like trade, can we both agree that like we can't make decisions like that about something as complicated? and multifaceted as trade as just saying like well a certain school of economists say it's good so it's good to go right um it i don't know what you mean by that um so like if if when you say that if you mean like just like polling like a single institute or getting the opinion of like a single economist i would agree but if you're taking that farther and you mean like all of academia surrounding economy right now is capitalist like propaganda and we can't trust any of the you well, know, no, empirical evidence well, like, no, that's yeah. Uh-huh. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's just that's like now we're getting in, back into the subreddit. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, be yeah. really charitable to you because okay. I know that you're not like this. But like this is a, some of the talking okay. points I get from a lot of people. They're even like medium sized content creators um, will, will basically come out with like, a well, all the literature is biased towards capitalism. So, of course, you think that this thing is good. And it's like, OK, well, I can't really have any conversation then because it's not like I'm doing like my own original research or publishing my own papers on this stuff. I kind of have to rely on what's reported. But um yeah, so I mean, like, well, yeah. so there's there's actually a really interesting two step with that mm-hmm. with trade, right? Like, because it is actually true, mm-hmm. and and I and I think these arguments are very tricky because I I like like I can read like I have a a, a friend and a, a a guest who works at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's totally brilliant. And I learn a ton from, right? And when people say like, oh, like you're fucking Marxist, but you have someone from the CFR on, you're a sellout. That's just like moronic and actually missing a lot of like valuable education about how institutions actually work. Now, at the same time, there is no question that if you are part of a certain, like the foreign policy apparatus, mm-hmm. Um, in DC, and this is not like conspiratorial. This is a combination of how people have been trained, what you know, underlying assumptions there are. Uh, there are not that many boundaries. Like this is why, as an example, actually the Koch brothers, ironically, are founding it. But there's a new multi-million-dollar think tank in DC specifically to house serious credible scholars and policymakers but who have like a serious non-interventionist uh, lane because that just literally was not promoted as the center of any think tank in dc for decades and there's a variety of reasons for that like mm-hmm. post-cold war politics donors and funding is definitely part of it so if you go to most economics and business departments i think what people who maybe they're not always presenting it in the most sophisticated way, but what they're pointing to is like, yes, Milton Friedman, like we were just talking about this last night. Like, yes, his chair was endowed and funded by, you know, small multinational corporations. This is a super imperfect analogy, but like, I don't know. I have, I have uh, like a little over 2,500 patrons, right? There are somewhere almost all, I actually have a handful of conservatives, which is interesting, Mm -hmm. but most of them are progressive to socialist. If I came out and I started doing segments on like, this is why we need to enforce the intellectual property provisions of the TPP, and you know, actually Medicare is going to you know face a funding cliff in 20 years, they probably won't want to fund that. So there is actually an analogy that isn't really that conspiratorial or complicated, which is like, it, academia and other institutions are funded by people who have self-interest and ideological viewpoints. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't 
produce research, but that, that and even really valuable research, but that research exists in a context, right? And I and I recognize like I've seen you debate and I've seen you get frustrated when it's all the context, man, starts to become like the move to evade everything, right? Like I understand that frustration, but at the same time, we do like live in the actual world and that's just like unavoidable. You know yeah, what I mean? So like I of 100%. course people's campaign donors, mm -hmm. of course people's, you know, like, yes, that shapes policy and institutions. Has that affected modern economics? Yes. I mean, that's why the last thing I'll say, I mean, Alan Greenspan, when he was questioned after the financial collapse in 2008, he said, oh, there was a fundamental error in my worldview. Now, that's fascinating, right? Because that doesn't mean that every single paper he churned out was wrong, technically. It doesn't mean that he got a fraudulent degree from NYU. It means, in his own words, there was a core defect in my ideological viewpoint. So it makes, and when you combine that with the fact that, it, as an example of trade, there's tons of economists, including highly credentialed ones, who have opposition to these agreements. So we can't even, it's not even as easy as, say, like the climate science one, where you could say, like, look, 99.9% .9 of these people do agree on something generally, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely not that like that on most issues. Yeah, so... I have to agree with that, that everything sits within some greater cultural context and to pretend that it doesn't, it, it like it gives you a, a horrendously naive analysis of the world. Um, and, and to draw even more parallels, like for instance, like we had a much different understanding of crime back in the 90s and that's where a lot of our tough on crime punishment bullshit right. kind of came from too. And it's not like everybody at that time was lying about crime or hated black people, just the understandings of it and the frames that we were looking through, like the broken window stuff was just wrong. It just wasn't a good way to, to accurately assess the situation. Now, if I'm being told this by a particular person. So I've said this on stream before. There are very, very, very few people in media that I trust or care about their opinions for. You and Sam Cedar are two of them. Um, I really like your guys' opinion. So when you tell me that, I, I can believe what you're saying there because I'm trusting that you're not using that excuse to just hand wave all of the information that doesn't agree with you because I think you'll probably take that into account anyway. I'm hoping that even if you say like, oh, you know, like there could be a certain bend ideologically in academic societies related to econ, but they still probably can give us something valuable. Like we can take, we can glean some information or some insight there. The problems I run into is that a lot of the arguments that you're making, and I know this doesn't necessarily apply to you, but a lot of people will use these in a conspiratorial manner, right? Like, oh, well, all of academia are uh, capitalist hacks, and so you can't trust literally anything. Um, NAFTA destroyed 90% of labor in the United States, um, you know, minimum wage, blah, blah, blah. Like, all, all, they'll jump off of that and make all these statements where I'm almost in this, this, uh, this like conspiratorial world where I can't trust any source on anything because the claim of the other person is that everything is biased, and it's like, okay, like, I mean, I can ignore knowledge that there might be some bend towards a particular ideology, but that doesn't mean we can just throw everything out the window. We can't have a real conversation now. Now it just comes down to who has like the best YouTube voice or something in terms of convincing you whose point is correct. Yeah. So that's an, int it's fascinating to me because it's like, yeah, but that's, that's another, ironically, a lot of your concerns that you're raising and, and mm -hmm. I think some of them, by the way, are, I hope people on my side and I hope they're not getting pissed at me. <laughs> Are watching this and th and actually seeing a lot of ways in which the discourse and the approach could be far more strategic and effective and welcoming. Uh, and I'm sorry, I do speak in those terms because I care about actually winning and acquiring influence. Yeah, of course. But you know, like you right. So like I, I know that you know. So yes, like so. But but yeah. So like as an example, when we go to trade. And I, I just want to leave this in, not to like mm -hmm. jack in the box or anything, just because I think it flows with the conversation. TPP is not really a primarily like a trade agreement, right? Like we actually already have a huge amount of trade with that part of the world. Um, even Paul Krugman, who wrote a column sort of like reluctantly opposing TPP, even though he was an ardent free trader, was basically like, Look, one reason I don't really support this is we basically already have a lot of trade activity in these parts of the world. And actually, in fact, the main driver of this, and this is according to leaked documents, and again, I'm, I am citing Krugman pretty intentionally here. He's not my cup of tea, but I think, you know, we're definitely not talking about a radical or an anti-capitalist source. So I'm trying to, you know, play in a, in a, you know, cite somebody who I think plays in a larger field here. Sure. And he was just like, look, if you read this, this is basically like the strong interest of Hollywood 
and pharmaceutical companies to get much more serious IP laws in emerging markets. Now, that maybe, you know, again, if we wanted to be really broad and, and charitable in your terms, you could say like, okay, that might mean that if you're a, a video game maker or some type of content creator in the Pacific Northwest who has a direct pipeline to Vietnam or Brunei, and you're going to lose far less money on bootlegs, the TPP might be a narrowly good deal for you. Mm -hmm. In the broader context, and the reason that you know there was actually really serious warnings from nurses unions and you know, very mainstream institutions of international public health advocates were like, no, actually in order to combat diseases, uh, in, you know, things like AIDS and malaria, but even to just like get accessible cancer medications to poorer people, those IP laws will be horrendous. And so, you know, that's a value choice. Obviously I choose global public health over IP laws, right? And that's like what we're debating. We're not debating like, some platonic, like, you know, Kenya has flowers, Ireland has potatoes, should they go to each other on boats and trade them? Like, that's not really how it works, you know? Mm -hmm. I, so, yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with you. I think maybe the quibbling will get over, like, into, like, these, I guess, like, these finer points. Um, so, like, for instance, when you talk about um, one, one common attack against the TPP is that it expands uh, pharmaceuticals' abilities to patent drugs in regions of the world that are going to be threatened by not having access to this medication. But, I mean, as far mm -hmm. as I was aware, the legislation of the TPP that existed before it became basically abandoned, was it, like, it aligned with the, um, I think it's called the Doha Declaration, that basically says mm -hmm. that, like, if you are part of a third world country, and you need to make some generic form of a drug, you can't use the TPP to get, essentially get cock blocked out of having your out of having a patent prevent you from making drugs that would save lives. So it seems like a lot of these kind of like fearish statements aren't necessarily placed in the best way. Well, that's the interesting thing because the Doha was round. That was a major fight mm -hmm. that was waged by countries like Brazil because Brazil under Lula, who I'm you know you probably know I'm a big fan of actually did a major dent on AIDS partially with generics. Sure. And there, that was a huge controversy. As an example, in the late 1990s, one of the reasons that the South African AIDS crisis exploded was that the Clinton administration put sanctions and threatened vicious economic policies on South Africa if they provided cheap generic alternatives. And the only reason that policy was flipped was that Al Gore was like publicly humiliated constantly by AIDS activists while he was running for president. So the Doha round is like a small incremental victory mm -hmm. by those forces. And they, it covers an incredibly narrow set of drugs, including with the exception of AIDS drugs, a lot of like, there's like this whole other set of like so-called tropical drugs where the problem is that there's no profit incentive to produce them. They aren't problems that affect developed countries and the people that need them don't have money. So the pharmaceutical companies just don't do R and D and say, fuck it. Mm -hmm. So they were happy to concede. Sure. There's a whole bunch of drugs we won't profit from that. Sure. You can do generics. We're not even in that business anyways. What the TPP does and the reason they, lobbied for it so aggressively and the reason that people who had even fought the, for the small reform of Doha that didn't really solve the problem sure. they snapped into gear because these things as it was as you know again from what was leaked it's a, it is objectively not a transparent process until the very end and i think you and i would be you know transparent and all members of congress would be transparent that like none of us have read the whole agreement sure, let's yeah. not bullshit Right. Although we that, could talk about that too, I'd put that in a note too. That that the complaints about transparency, I think, are really misfounded well, as well. But I want to finish this public, I want to finish yeah, this public health thing quickly. So, mm -hmm. so actually, the IP laws that those companies were lobbying for would apply to a much broader set uh, than the Doha is the understanding, and that's why it was a problem. So, no, Doha would not necessarily protect it at all. Sure. So maybe the Doha uh, declaration doesn't go far enough, um, but I don't think that I don't think that having some of these potential problems is like a reason to abandon the entire agreement. Um, you mentioned earlier the transparency thing. I don't know if you want to jump into that. Well, or, wait, I, or I guess wanna... I'm, I'm, I'm here. I guess I'm, well, I just want to stick on that a second. Yeah, sure. So, so Joe Biden, right? And mm -hmm. I'm, I'll take him at face value, even though I don't normally do that. He said a couple of days ago that in his current iteration, and Hillary Clinton said this too, that as they revisited it, they realized that there was a variety of problems that needed to be significantly improved in it. For sure. 
So I guess like abandon it is I, I'm not that's just like a generic state. Like I, that doesn't mean anything like abandon. Well, we didn't sign it, right? It became defunct. Be re- well, yeah, we don't sign it because it can be renegotiated because it can be rewritten to actually reflect how it was sold. And, and in fact, another thing, too, that's really important about these agreements, which you can weave if you want with transparency. I don't think, to be honest with you, that's not, you're not, you're not going to, like, that doesn't exercise me as much as it exercises other people. But we can get there in a minute. But another thing, like, you'd have to do is, you know, and again, is is you'd also have to make the environmental and labor side agreements just as enforceable and sort of aggressively internationally uh, organized as the ones that actually protect things like copyrights. So sure, let's rewrite the TPP and make it a higher standard trade deal. I, I really, I actually don't think, I think even including many Marxists mm-hmm. would absolutely not, you know, if, if more, most of the global poverty that's been, re- you know, alleviated in the last several decades, I mean, it's a lie that it's been trade and free markets just, okay. it's been, a, I mean, most of it is China and China has a totally government directed, highly intervened highly you know supports its own industries in ways that like smaller countries and wto agreements are not allowed to do and that is worth noting but then also even like what the um pink tide countries did in brazil was take advantage of a commodity boom to you know build incredible social safety nets that lifted 70 million people out of poverty so sure let's write a better tpp that you know, it protects public health and I get, you know, makes it easier to trade video games or whatever. That's fine. Sure. But like when you talk about like, um, so the TPP had a lot of these like labor and environmental provisions in it. When we leave those negotiations, I mean, you say we can renegotiate it, but all those countries have already signed on now that the United States has abandoned that agreement and that we just aren't part of those negotiations anymore. So if we did feel like... Those are are two different arguments. So I just, I have a question Mm -hmm. for you though. Yeah, sure. All of agreements from NAFTA to the Korea trade agreement, they have all had and Democratic presidents have made a lot of noise about side, let's just fix, let's just say environmental side agreements, right? And I, and the, so, and we know about the investor dispute mechanism. Sometimes it goes the corporation's way, mostly it does, sometimes it doesn't. But we know that in these agreements, there actually is international adjudication for when a company says, I'm being treated unfairly. They can go to do a bureaucratic process, right? We agree yep. with that, right? Yeah, the ISTS. Do you yeah. know how, how many environmental cases have been brought up underneath side agreements in any of these trade agreements in the last couple of decades? What do you mean by side agreements? Like ISDS arbitrating? So or? Side, just the same way the TPP, it specifically has a side agreement inside the bill, but they used to be called side agreements, but it's functionally the same thing. It's the It's the part that says... Here are all this nice things we'll do with to the environment. How many enforceable actions have been brought into any of these trade agreements that are the same as TPP, but they're written for, say, Korea or mm-hmm. Central America or CAFTA? Actually, I don't think CAFTA didn't have a side one. How many? I don't think CAFTA had a side one. I need to double check that. How many of them had environmental enforcement mechanisms that were brought to bear in those cases? When you How say many? an environmental enforcement mechanism, do you mean like a specific part of the agreement that says that like if you violate I'm this provision? Like you're invi- so if, if in these agreements, and just as with some of the market stuff, mm-hmm. countries violate these things all the time or other countries think they're violating these things all the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, Canada goes to the United States, says, hey, there's a side environmental agreement in NAFTA. You just uh, built, you know, 20 new uh, smokestack uh, plants in Ohio. That's going to cause our kids, uh, you know, asthma through the uh, through the, um, you know, weather patterns, whatever. (laughs) You know, I'm just talking how many enforcement. So just to be clear, we know that there's multiple enforcement mechanisms under Chapter 11 in NAFTA, whereas an example like. There's a Canadian gasoline company that sues under the state of California under WTO rules for eliminating a gas additive. They won that one, by the way. So we know there's multiple examples like that where a corporation is able to say, you're violating a trade agreement. I want international enforcement under this global bureaucracy to 
protect my trade interests. Wait, are you and now, so wait, when you cite that particular case, are you saying that like that was like a, an example of like a corporation doing something that was like hurting the environment or Well, it literally what no no no, you're no no no. I'll slow down. Sure. What I'm saying is that in these agreements mm -hmm. there are clear mechanisms if you and I are trading Sure. Well, wait, I, well I I'm, say that, I'm really curious about this no, no, example I, that you use for this, over the Canadian gas additive. No, 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 no. I don't. I don't want to get sidetracked because this is a really important over, overarching point. Sure. This is this is fun. I mean, this is the this is the disagreement about TPP. Period. Okay. Like this this is what settles it one way or another, basically. Okay. If you and I are have a disagreement, if we're trading back and forth, mm -hmm. and I'll go really stereotypical here. Say say I'm I'm Hollywood. You're China, right? Um, and then I say, you are bootlegging rush hour three, um, or you, you know, you're, you're stealing some patent and I actually, I shouldn't even use, I mean, China basically has enough power to just say, fuck you say you're Vietnam. I'm going to go to the WTO as paramount or whatever. And I'm going to say such and such an action is taking place. This interferes with my ability to do trade. It's a violation of the common framework on trade and sheriffs going back to GATT. And the uh, trade judges will more than likely not say, yes, you are correct, Vietnam, you need to stop that practice and go back to training, right? And I'm not even saying in that example that that's wrong. That's just the way those agreements work. Okay. Now, what you've said before is that there are agreements in the TPP, just like in the Korea trade deal or NAFTA, that cover the environment, mm -hmm. because we're focusing on the environment now. Yep that have also international enforcement mechanisms. So what I'm saying is that there's multiple cases where country X says that country Y, always on behalf of a corporation, because that's mm -hmm. who's involved in the trade, yeah. has said, you, uh, you're you violating um, a part of our agreement by doing X, we're gonna go to the international tribunal and get a ruling on it. That happens all the time, and under TPP, the power of that would actually be extended, which is another reason that people objected to it. Sure. What I'm saying is if, if environmental conditions were as serious under these agreements, you would assume that there would also be hundreds of cases of country X is in violating its environmental obligations, correct? Um, maybe, I don't know if you would need to bring in the TPP to enforce that though, because the local well, laws- why? Well, I, mean, I really want to respond to the earlier point that you brought up about the. the well, why would you have the environmental agreement in the TPP then? So how is that a defense of the TPP? So the, the so the environmental agreement as part of the TPP basically says that if a country changes its laws to do something that is beneficial to the environment, a foreign co corporation can't sue that government and, and reclaim lost profits because they're doing something to um, to, to clean their environment up. That, that's what those acts um, are, are for. That's what those provisions but, are for. But it so, says well, that there is a common. No, no, no. It's the, this is really important. I agree, but I There's really want to go back to an earlier example. Standards. What? I really want to go back to your early example because no, no, I don't... no, no. We can go back as soon as we get this because <laughs> okay. there's a really important, there's a really important answer and really yeah. obvious one you're not giving me, okay. which is that none, there has been zero environmental enforcement under any of these agreements. And I just want to be really clear. Okay. And I'm not saying you're doing this intentionally, obviously, but that is not what these agreements say. I don't there, think the job of the TPP is to say, enforce that. Sorry, go ahead. Then why do you then why do you cite those as defenses of the agreement then? B because then they're irrelevant. No, no. The, so the then TPP they're, then they're not defense. So I don't think the job of the TPP is to go in and enforce like an environmental standard on a country. More so, protect an environmental standard that a country has on the books and prevent foreign corporations from suing them for implementing new environmental standards. Well, then you can also see that. Well, that's but that's again. So if that's your thought of what mm -hmm. the TPP is. You don't even agree with the TPP either. You should tear it up and get rid of the environmental and labor sure. enforcement agreement. So that might be because true. you're so, not. So no. So I just want to be really clear then. I really want to go not, back to your early example. It's killing me, Michael. Well, but we're gonna gotta do this because this is the big story. But you built so this you, all. You built this so off of an example that perfectly me. illustrates my problem well, with this. No, this. This is the agreement, though. This is what people object to. So you don't even no. Just to be really clear, yeah, you actually are attack. You disagree from the right with Obama and Biden and Clinton that there should be enforceable agreements in these agreements. Well, I mean, every agreement has to be enforceable to some extent. Otherwise, it's well on the environment and labor. You just said that 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 wasn't the job of the TPP. So when these candidates come out and they say, 
And Obama said this multiple times, that the TPP has the best environmental and enforce and labor standards that are enforceable. And they are not just pre-existing bills on the books because if they were, then they couldn't go to Brunei and say you can't do child labor. Those are all new laws. That's not and an fact, environmental standard. Those are labor standards. That's something separate, which well, is something. The same principle. There's no objections. On, there hasn't been a enforcement. I was just using labor as an example. Um, okay, sure. Environment as an example. There hasn't been enforcement on labor either. There hasn't been. So, but I mean, if we look at Vietnam pre and post TPP signing, you did see that Vietnam was moving in a certain direction where they were allowing trade organization or uh, trade unions to show up, where they were allowing more people to have some political freedom, where they were kind of scaling back some of the... Well, like, definitely, I mean, the, the political liberalization of Vietnam goes back to the 1990s. Sure, but they abandoned now, a lot of that when we pulled out of the TPP. When that pressure was gone, they immediately reversed on a lot of those decisions. No, that's, that's a really... I mean, that's... A, so look, here's what I'll do. Wait, okay. That's a really... <laughs> No, no, no. This is yep. no. This is important. That's a okay. really. This is what happened. No, this is really crucial. Okay. So if you're right about Vietnam, mm -hmm. and you could be right. Okay. All the more reason to back my position on TPP, because if you actually have inside these agreements, if you wrote an agreement and renegotiated it, and everybody could renegotiate it, and they and the reason and believe me. None of the Asian underdeveloped trading partners are upset at a bill that would be better on generic drugs. Trust me. Every, in fact, every single WTO round, you always see people from developing countries demanding greater negotiations, more reciprocity, and incidentally, on our end, less double standards because we still have all sorts of sneaky tariffs and all sorts of double-edged shit. Mm -hmm. But if Vietnam was moving in incremental directions, which I I could concede, although that process okay. is decades long. Sure. It's not just because of TPP. Then that's great. Then what we need is we need an environmental group movement, environmental agreement on a TPP that has a equally enforceable statute for environmental and labor protections. And this is another reason why, and I'm a pure Sanders supporter, Elizabeth Warren's trade deal in some ways quite smart because what she says, and we have a framework which would be really easy to do this, which is that you incorporate the global bare minimum standards of the International Organization of Labor, which is already a global organization in Geneva that already sets standards that works and, and understands these institutions but doesn't have the same power, and they can enforce alongside trade bureaucrats, another set of conditions and standards, which is precisely what TPP is sold on. In fact, if TPP was what Obama said it was, we would all support it. Um, okay, there's like 20 million things. So first of all, the, the um, <laughs> is it the IOL, the inter inter is it the International Organization of Labor Standards or whatever? That provision? International, yeah. International Organization of Labor. Yeah. That's what, so Elizabeth Warren says, let's make them set uh, global labor standards as well. That was in the and TPP, if, though. That Those requirements yeah. were there for you to be a trading partner in the That's TPP. That's what I just explained to you, though, okay. but not enforceable. That's what I just explained. That's the reason. See, if you don't have an enforcement mechanism, this is – see, this is why, like, things – I think this is where things get really interesting, right? Yeah. If it's just theoretical, then it's just – the then, like, it's just air. Like, sure, like – Trade is good. Trade is bad. In trade, you can make an argument. Actually, accelerated trade is very bad for the climate. You know, we there's all sorts of arguments we can have, and they're interesting and ethereal. Okay. But I like to talk like in actual policy. Sure. So that agreement and all of these agreements, they have a provision for investors. If an investor says, "Country X is violating my," uh, terms on foreign direct investment mm -hmm. and it is not just expropriation it's there have been any number of cases brought on it sometimes they win sometimes they lose but i'm talking about the structure okay there is a structure that values investors over worker and environmental concerns wait how that's the quality of those agreements wait, how does the structure now, favor them no, in because they're the only ones with internationally enforceable standards for their interests. I mean, that's, come on, that can't be complicated. I, I don't understand what you mean, though. The ISDS panels have people chosen from both parties that can represent them. And, no, and also, wait, what that's do you mean, not, no, they don't? Yes, they that's, that, how, Wait, wait, okay, wait, hold on, wait, I, but I don't even agree. Firstly, I don't understand no, what, what you say. When you, when you, wait, wait, when you say that only an investor, wait, can I, <laughs> hold on. When you say no, that only in, when you, when what you, basis do you say 
Sides. W- because that's where do you get the- it's literally in the provisions of the TPP for how they nominate the panels both of the sides. You mean both countries? No, no. For an investor and a country, both of them get to nominate people to panels. That's and- investor country. Nobody from environmental or labor. Okay, but I don't understand. Right. Okay, I don't when, when you say that these things favor. I just want to be really clear. I just want to be really. Clear. <laughs> no, no, no. Slow down. Slow I'm, well, down. I'm, not, I'm. I have to go fast because I haven't said well, anything. These are like. Well, but these are the points. No, no, you but, know, like, the, I don't, but I don't know. I disagree like with these, so many things that I haven't got to address. But like, there's nothing. Okay, I mean, I don't know what's your disagreement. But I. Wait, look, oh, well, let me dis- tell you then. Wait, can I tell you one disagreement? So you're, okay, but you got to stay inside the parameters of what is actually happening in reality. Okay, well, okay. So, fuck. There's like a million things. The, the most recent thing you said that the, the the TPP only favors like investors bringing suits to other countries or whatever. This is what I would expect to happen. Why why would a country sue another country for something related to business going on in that country? That that doesn't even make sense. Like if I, if I'm making a trade agreement, I want to protect any firm that originates in my country doing business in another country. I want to protect them from the other country um, enacting laws that make them non-competitive. That's part of the trade. But why would my country itself? Why would the United States want to sue another? another member of the TPP. It doesn't make sense that you would have like- Wait a second, why? Okay, so now, right. Why would they do that? So why would Congress deregulate derivatives? Why would the Trump administration relax laws on mining pollution? Why would they do that? What is what is deregulating derivatives or things related to the EPA have to do well, with just trade agreements? The follow the logic. Okay. Think, think it out. Think I'm guessing that we they- probably deregulate them because there's- I mean, it depends on the provision. Trump will do EPA no, related stuff no, because no, it no, plays no, well it, to his base, it, derivatives it, it, because we want. Keep it, no, 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 no. Keep it simple. Why would the Republican Party, let's just sure. be super generic. Yep. Why would they strip environmental standards on mining in West Virginia? Why would they do that? Because they think it'll make the businesses more profitable. Why? Okay. Yes. And maybe because they also get donations and support from those businesses. Probably. Yeah. Why? Sure, yeah. So why? Would the Democratic Party in this case, leaders in the Democratic and Republican parties, both of whom do in fact get quite a bit of money from pharmaceutical industry, okay. go to bat for an agreement that would favor the pharmaceutical industry patents over global public health? Because you generally would want to favor patents in your for your firms going to other okay, countries to do trade agreements. Make, like that's a totally fair make, point. Sure, you can make that's a t- totally fair point. And sure. the, and other it's other people would say that global public health and pandemics are far more important than that, that there's a, that the trade agreements provide actually a very limited value. They only favor very small geographies and sectors relative to other ones. That's why there's not just partisan disagreements on these trade agreements. There's also geographic ones. So you could say all of that. Okay. And you could even be occasionally narrowly right. But what you could never not say, and this is just reflects the disproportionate power. Like, again, would you agree that pharmaceutical companies have more power in our society today writ large than labor unions, right? That's pretty obvious, I right? I would say all, it, it seems to me that all capital in Western society has more power than any anything related to labor right now, of course. Right. So they have the most power. They have the most influence to throw around this. And I really hope you don't think this is conspiratorial. They can write and influence legislation and agreements to benefit them at the expense of other sectors, whether or not that is a domestic piece of legislation that deregulates or an international agreement that has unenforceable, toothless environmental and labor standards, which granted, you've said you don't even want to have those in there, but that's a very extreme position. That is not... The Clinton, that's just to be clear, that's not the Clinton Obama Biden position. So I'm defending their position now. No, what they well, say is their position. I, when, when you so say labor or environment. If you don't have those, so then if you have an agreement that literally says if you violate something on, that could pertain to my copyright, no moral claim, great, whatever, protect your copyright, there is an enforcement mechanism. That has serious consequences for the other member country's economy, and that will be enforced. Whereas if somebody says, oh, you just violated an environmental condition, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. 
oh, you're still doing child labor? You still don't allow independent trade unions? Eh, well, you know, shame on you. Those agreements structurally favor certain sets of the economy. And if the core argument does start to come down to whether you're a progressive or a centrist or whatever, the basic disagreement that people like me think like, no, we need to much more radically rebalance the standards of society. You can't have a trade agreement that just favors the pharmaceutical industry. And in fact, yes, it's good for a handful of jurisdictions, mainly in like New Jersey and DC lobbying firms that has no trickle down on most normal people. And I know you know that because I've seen you debate a bunch of right wing idiots. You don't defend those kind of economic policies. So that yes, you can have trade, but there also needs to be public health there also needs to be labor. There also needs to be the environment. If we wrote TPP and trade agreements as that, we could all support it. But unfortunately, that's not what they are because of incumbent interests, just like with other legislation. And I, I, I want you to respond, but I, I have like five minutes, so we should, we should do this again. <laughs> okay. But I have to in a minute. The very first example that you gave is a great example of a lot of the problems that I have when people talk about the TPP or they talk about the disproportionate amount of power investors have when it comes to overriding these sort of environmental things. So the first thing that you referenced, I don't know if you made this up off your head or you were referencing the real case, was when Ethel Corp um, was a company that did uh, gas delivery or whatever. They had like, they, I think they had gas stations or something in Canada. And Canada mm -hmm. tried to make it illegal for them to use a certain fuel additive. And and using ISDS, um, that firm brought a case against the Canadian government. And obviously, the way that this was put out in the news was, look, there's a firm trying to bring a court case here. They're trying to destroy our environmental regulations. Um, you know, they're just doing horrible things to ruin the environment. This is a good example of corporations. Trying this. But that wasn't at all what that case was. Canada only outlawed, the only party pushing to outlaw that specific additive was doing it because they were the only company that was using it. It was only to make that company non-competitive. That was the whole point well, of that law. Can the Canadian, wait, 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 the Canadian government itself, but the Canadian, to be clear, wait, wait, for me to be really clear, the Canadian government is clear. That's great, but that is irrelevant. It's That's not great. because the Canadian government itself totally a year prior to that That's had little, ruled that that additive had no negative environmental impact. And so even though. That's your interpretation of that case, and that's fine. That's interesting. It doesn't hinge on the fundamental argument. The federal government still agreed to pay a hundred and thirty million dollar, you know, settlement, right? Which they should. So they want. Okay. Wait. Great. So you support that? Again, there's no analog with labor or with the environment. In 2012, there was a U.S. pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly. They launched a suit against the Canadian court. I'm I'm quoting now rejecting monopoly uh, patent protections from two other drugs after finding insufficient evidence that they could deliver the promised results, right? Wait, I'm sorry, can like, you say this again? Multiple, there's multiple cases like this is the point, but I'm not gonna uh, go sure. into like, like the rabbit hole of this. I, I would, because, I, well, no, you say rabbit hole, see, but these are important like real life examples for how these- actually not, because honestly, if your agreement held, and maybe again, it's just a framework difference, but if you said, Look, Michael, if you go back the last 20 years, there are multiple cases where under WTO rules, a, you know, uh, the, a labor union in New York went to the WTO and they said, you know, there's a rule in this side agreement that bans a certain type of labor organizing. Or it went to Columbia. It says, we're doing a free trade agreement across the Americas and Coca-Cola is actually subcontracting paramilitaries that kill labor organizers. This is a violation of every rule we have on the book. And there should be a civil or criminal penalty on Coca-Cola and a penalty for the US as a foreign direct investor, whatever. And the WTO said, yep, that's our labor committee and we agree with you and that's enforceable. And then later in the day, they decided, oh, that was actually just a sneaky move that was framed as an environmental move in order to uh, just do a sort of blatant act of protectionism. Some of these cases you're wrong on. Some of these cases I'm right on. We have different interpretations. That's fine. But the broader argument about what this agreement is is unavoidable. And that's the fundamental distinction. But I actually, I really do have to run. But we could do this again if you want. Yeah, sure. I would love to go over some more specifics of this sometime. But thanks for the conversation. Hey, man, it was my pleasure, for real. Mm -hmm.
I mean, I hope I, I, I know we, we it, it went places. I hope we got some good stuff done, though. OK, I really appreciate it, man. Have a All good right. One. All right. Take care, man. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> I've actually been up until like four or five a.m. I've actually done so much reading on the TPP. I hate my life right now.